I've always been told that it's not the size that matters, Philip. It's what you do with it that counts. And you know what? It's true. And of course, I'm referring to camera sensor sizes. In this video, my aim is to clear up some common misconceptions about sensor sizes. Misconceptions that occur simply because of their name. Now, be prepared for lots of facts and figures, more than I'd normally go into. But it's such a fascinating yet frustrating topic that I think you will find it interesting. If not, go and check out my cat channel. It's pretty good. Now, there's two different ways of measuring video camera sensors. Large sensors are measured based on film cameras. This video will be concentrating on the smaller sensors that we find in the cameras you see. I find it rather astonishing that we measure video camera sensors in 2021 based on technology that is even older than me and that became obsolete about three decades ago. You see, back when the world was black and white, interlaced and fuzzy, televisions and television cameras used vacuum tubes to capture and display images. And this is where TV got its slang name of the tube from. And of course the name YouTube came from that. But you probably already know this, so let's just move on to the more interesting stuff. Right now you're looking at two antiques, me and this Sony AVC 3200CE camera. This was a very popular black and white studio camera from around 50 years ago. This particular one like me, was made in 1971. Yes, I just turned 50. And that's why you're seeing me through this knackered old TV. There is no optical filter that can help me at this stage. At least I am still going strong, unlike this camera, which I bought specifically for this video to show you a tube camera working. But five minutes after turning it on, smoke came out of it. At its core was a single two third inch tube, much like this one here. There's only one in it because it's a black and white camera. The majority of colour tube cameras needed a tube for each of the red, green and blue colours. And for the sake of simplicity and a video that isn't two hours long, I'm not going to go into fully how this all works because I honestly I really do know you just need to know that light from the lens falls onto this photoconductive surface and thanks to things like electrons and coils and a sprinkling of fairy dust, an image is popped out of the end. It then either needs to be recorded or just live. This particular camera has no onboard recording ability. Tube cameras would eventually be replaced by cameras with solid state sensors. The first camera sensor was invented around the same time as this camera model was released back in 1969. It's called the Charge Coupled Device or CCD for short, which you've probably heard of. The resolution and performance initially was inferior to the tube cameras, but clearly this was the future. By the mid 1980s, CCD video cameras were really taking over. I just missed out on them when I started working for Sky News back in 1989. And the first professional video camera that I used there was this Betacam SP BVP50 front with the BVV5 back. A truly heavy beast and is the reason why my back is the mess that it is. It used three CCD solid state sensors for the red, green and blue. Their size, the same as this tube camera, two third inch. Now, if you don't know the history of cameras, you would assume that a two third inch camera sensor refers to its dimensions in some way. Maybe the diagonal, the horizontal, or maybe the vertical. It doesn't. The actual dimensions for a standard two third inch sensor are 8.8 .8 millimeters by 6.6 .6 millimeters with a diagonal of 11 millimeters. Two thirds of an inch is 17 millimeters. 
The two third inch measurements actually come from those vacuum tube cameras, the outer diameter of the tube. Not the actual imaging area that's used, which is roughly one third smaller than that total diameter. In a way, it's a bit like CRT TVs, like this 10 inch one. The 10 inch refers to the tube case, not the actual glass part that you're actually looking at. Back in the olden days, before most of you were born, if you bought a large TV for home, like 32 inch, which was considered big at the time, the actual viewable area was more like 28 inches. Whereas modern flat panel TVs, the screen size is the inner diameter, the actual viewable area. So my 65 inch LG OLED is actually 65 inches. It's the same with all these flat displays. I mean, it's just annoyingly logical to have measurements which refer to what you are actually using and seeing, right? CRT TVs and monitors aren't made anymore. So that way of measuring your screen has thankfully died with them. But the same cannot be said for video camera sensors, despite tube cameras dying out well before CRT TVs. All the sensors in the cameras on this table have variations of what are called one inch sensors. The two slightly odd ones out, which are also the oldest cameras here, the digital Bolex and the original Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera, were sold as having super 16mm size sensors, which is a film measurement. As they were marketed as cinema cameras, it makes sense, right? Even though they are more or less the same as one inch sensors. The other cameras all have variations of the same Sony one inch sensor with the actual physical dimensions of 13.2 width and 8.8 millimeter height. One inch converted to metric is 25.4 millimeters. So just like the two set inch sensor, no part of this one inch sensor is close to one inch. In fact, this size is actually slightly bigger than the width of the APS-C sensors inside Sony's mirrorless cameras. And that's most definitely not what we have in these cameras. Rather than change the system and describe newly developed camera sensor sizes by their actual size, some boffins somewhere decided to double down on the madness. A complicated hypothetical measurement system was devised to continue naming sensor sizes based on what it would be like if they were inside a vacuum tube. This is called the optical format, where the diagonal measurement of a sensor is multiplied by three over two to give you what the tube measurement would be if that sensor was inside it. Yeah, it's very silly. It gets messier if that calculation doesn't work out as an exact fraction because a decimal will be added to it. That's why you get center sizes like 1 over 2.3 inches and these slightly smaller 1 over 2.5 inches. When DJI brought out their Mavic Air 2, part of the big improvement of it over the original Mavic Air was the center size was now a half inch one whereas the original one had a 1 over 2.3 inch sensor. Almost a year later they released this, the Air 2S, and it does have a much bigger sensor, the 1 inch sensor. This was a huge focus of the marketing and of the hype. I absolutely welcomed it as it has a surface area four times bigger on that sensor than the Mavic Air 2. And the image, because of that, and some other things, is a big improvement. But if you wanted to look up exactly what that sensor's physical measurements were, aside from that one inch, good luck finding it on their specs. And it's the same with this little Insta360 1R 1 inch edition, not the catchiest name. Again, the one inch center part was the big selling point. But all you need to know was that it was a one inch sensor. You didn't need to know the exact measurements because one inch is better. And that is actually true. 
Uh, look at these headlines for the new Sharp Aquos, I guess that was called, R6 smartphone. The sensor is a variant of that same one inch Sony sensor. Massive though? Well, I guess it depends on what you're comparing it to. Most mobile phones have one over 2.3 inch sensors. So yeah, the sensor in the Sharp is more than four times bigger. But is that really what you would call massive though? To me, massive would be what's inside my Pentax 645Z medium format camera and my Fuji GFX 100 medium format camera. They have about the same 42.8 millimeters by 32.8 millimeters. I don't think we're going to see anything of that size in a phone anytime soon. Or maybe we will. The thing is that Sony, who actually make most of these sensors in the world, don't even use the word inch or symbol for inch when describing their sensors. The sensor in this ZV-1 is called a 1.0 type sensor, not one inch. It's still the same fraction, referring to that same hypothetical tube measurement, but at least they make a point of not using the word inch. It's still confusing if you don't know what that fraction is referring to, but at least using the word type and not inch is less misleading. And they do actually list the actual physical size of the sensors of their cameras in the specs next to that. Something which can't always be said for most of the other brands who use their sensors. The one inch sensor has never been more in demand or popular than it is today. And it really is great to see it in so many different types of cameras. And you can get some really fantastic results with them. But just like any sensor and any camera, big part of that really is the glass you put in front of it. And that's where things get really interesting. With all this history, numbers, and information, you're probably feeling a little bit like you're back at school. But I'm a strong believer in understanding the why and how of things. I always try and make my videos have some sort of educational tutorial aspect to them. So you take away something that you may not have known before. And if there is something you still aren't sure about, you can always just ask me in the comments section. You may well be thinking, that's handy that Philip has all these shots of classrooms for this video. I don't, because these are all from Storyblocks, the sponsor of this video. They're a resource that I've been using for quite a while now, well before they started sponsoring some of my videos. And they've come in so handy numerous times when I need to find a shot to fill a hole or to bring an entire idea to life, like I did in my DJI Air 2S review. It's so easy to find the shots you want. For these classroom shots, I simply typed in classroom and downloaded dozens of royalty-free clips and I just use the ones that work the best. I have their unlimited downloads plan, which includes videos, music, templates, sound effects, and more. There's different plans to suit your needs. And yeah, click the link in the description below to find out more. Okay, kids, that's your break over. Back to the lesson. If you've been watching my videos for a while, you'll know I do love me some shallow depth of field. It's why I fell in love with the Canon 5D Mark II back when it came out. Because prior to that, I had been using a 2 3rd inch sensor for about 17 years on my Betacam cameras. The only way to get some really nice bokeh, not that I knew what that was called back then, was by shooting at the end of the lens. Of course, a 35mm sensor is substantially bigger than a 1 inch sensor. So you're never going to get the same amount of shallow depth of field at the same distances from a subject. But can you get any shallow depth of field with this little sensor? Absolutely, of course you can. But like any camera, it depends on key factors. Your distance from the subject, the distance from your subject to the background, and very much your lens. 
The Sony ZV-1 has a 9.4 to 25.7 millimeter lens with an f1.8 aperture. And this is what that means if you turn it into a full frame equivalent, both the millimeters of the lens and the aperture. What this means is that at the widest point of the lens of the ZV-1, 9.4 millimeters, and wide open at f1.8, if you wanted to match the same field of view and depth of field using a full frame camera, you would need a 25.38 millimeter lens. So let's just make that 25 millimeters with an f-stop of f4.86, which I will round up to f5. Suddenly your ZV-1 doesn't sound so sexy lens-wise. But what do you expect? The surface area of a full frame camera sensor is more than seven times that of a one inch sensor inside the ZV-1. But you still can get a shallow depth of field, as you can see. You just need to be more realistic about just how much you can get. If you've seen my two DJI Air 2S videos, you'll seen that you aren't limited to deep depth of field shots with this drone, despite the fact it's a 22 millimeter full frame equivalent lens with a f2.8 aperture which when we convert that aperture to what you'd have with a full frame camera you are straddling between f7.1 and f8 you've already seen some of my shallow depth of field shots with the air 2s and it is achievable with that drone and also with the mavic 2 pro but you do need to get pretty close to your subject uncomfortably close if you want to get your background more out of focus and not have to be really close to your subject then you are going to need a much faster lens than we have on any of these cameras in fact what you need is an interchangeable lens one inch sensor camera and nobody makes those well they did these two cameras aren't made anymore both sensors are called super 16 besides wise as i've mentioned already are basically one inch sensors and in case you're wondering where the 16 millimeter part of the measurement comes from it refers to the entire width of the film including the perforations or sprockets not the actual part of the film that's used for the image so it's a bit like tubes really I've shot some lovely stuff with both of these cameras, but it wasn't shallow depth of field that I was interested in with them. Because after all, I already had full frame and super 35 millimeter cameras then. So why would I really want to try and emulate that? Just a bit silly. Both cameras have a really lovely look, especially the digital Bolex with its CCD sensor made by Kodak. And CCD sensors have global shutters. So what this camera was, was a really great handheld camera but what it wasn't was a low light camera no this is not a low light camera but i love the look of the old kodak sensor it just has a lovely organic quality to it the black magic pocket cinema camera with its cmos sensor still looks great and it's probably one of my favorite images from their cameras I mostly used Micro Four Thirds glass with it because that's what the mount is. But I also use this lovely Ingenue 17.5 to 70mm Super 16 lens, which I picked up at eBay. It was an utter joy to use and the results were lovely. These aren't 4K cameras. The Blackmagic is HD, Digital Bolex is 2K. I really would like to see a camera manufacturer make a 4K Super 16mm camera with interchangeable lenses. Now, the market for it is probably quite niche. Yeah, Americans, you call that niche, but it's niche. But as one inch sensors are everywhere in cameras with fixed lenses, it does seem like the next logical move to make something different with them. And as I lack patience, I took it into my own hands and 
made my own, rather than waiting for something which really may never happen. The Insta360 1R system of cameras are really cool. We've got a Bray A360 camera, a 4K action camera with a 1 over 2.3 inch sensor, and of course the 1 inch version. And that can record in up to 5.3K 30p and 4K 60p. And it also has fantastic inbuilt stabilization. The lens is just over five millimeters with a fixed aperture of 3.2. The full frame equivalent is 14 millimeter F8 lens. It's also a fixed focus lens with a minimum focus distance of 90 centimeters. So forget about getting anything shallow with it. No chance. The only thing that's going to be out of focus is your subject if it's a little bit too close to it. It is, after all, designed to be an action camera. A couple of weeks ago, I saw that a Canadian company called Backbone had made these mod kits for the Sony RX0, RX02, as well as ones for the Insta360 ONE R 4K and the One Inch Edition. So I bought it. And surrounded by my cats and their lovely cat hair, I attempted to install it myself, which is really something way beyond my pay grade. I found a woman, she took my love. But God sent that a woman from heaven above. She's young and tender, I'm a wild as a lark. That's about as much difference as daylight and dark. But I said I'll change my ways for you. Well, I'll change my ways for you. Yes, I'll change my ways for you. I wonder this heart proves untrue. Well, I yelled at freedom for something new. Said I'll change my ways for you. I now had an interchangeable lens, one inch sensor, 5.3K video camera, with a micro four thirds mount. You also get a C mount with it, but I put on the micro four thirds one as you can easily adapt C mount lenses to go on micro four thirds. And I've got a lot of C mount lenses and I've got a lot of micro four third lenses. They need to be manual because you've got nothing like autofocus and stuff like that. And it's really fun using lenses like this, especially the vintage ones. But not all of them are going to work. A lot of C-mount lenses are really only going to work when they're not wide angle. A lot of them are designed for just 16mm film, which isn't as wide as Super 16. I do have some excellent wide angle lenses for Micro Four Thirds, so that wasn't a problem. The best one is this Lauer 7.5mm f2. And yeah, it's, it's a nice image and it was fun to shoot with. And it's a fun experiment, but not really a very practical camera to use. The screen on it is tiny, so critical focus on it is near impossible. You can't punch in on it, that's what you get. But you can use the app via Wi-Fi to monitor the image, but the quality isn't that great, it's quite compressed, and you can only see it this way around. You cannot get a landscape image. Well, actually, the only time you can fill the screen with a preview of an image is when you turn your camera 90 degrees to go into vertical video mode. No, no thanks. The other issue is this is not a very good handheld camera as it has really bad rolling shutter. But when you use the camera with the lens that you're supposed to use with it, you know, the one that I pulled out, you won't see this because of the excellent flow state stabilization. It's labeled as a 14 millimeter equivalent, which means for this sensor, that is 5.2 millimeter lens. And I don't have any 5.2 millimeter lenses. If I did, in theory, the stabilization should work just as well as that lens that I pulled out. The closest I have is a six millimeter, and that sadly does vignette but you can switch your field of view in the camera, put it onto linear mode, you mostly lose it. 
but you do still get a little bit of wobble if you aren't careful because it's not 5.2 millimeters. This camera needs to be used on a tripod or a gimbal. And I'm definitely gonna continue experimenting with it, especially as you can just pop out the infrared blocker to make it an infrared camera. If you really want to shoot with a camera with this sensor size, with interchangeable lenses, I really would recommend getting a secondhand Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera because you're not going to find a digital Bolex very easily. It may not be 4K, it might have slow motion, but the image is very nice and it's a lot more practical than this and cheaper as you can pick one up for less than 500 pounds second hand but yeah this was a lot of fun to do so hopefully all this sensor size nonsense is a little bit clearer now i don't think the system is going to change anytime soon if ever they could easily just use a diagonal or the width as a standard just quoting that the width would give you a better indication of the sensor size as a diagonal really would change depending on the aspect ratio of that sensor. Is it really so bad to have something called a 13.2 millimeter sensor? I know it's not an exciting or catchy name, but one inch? Is that really that much better? Yeah, it's one inch. Sounds a bit small anyway. Maybe name them after the crop factor. Yeah, 2.7 times. Sounds quite cool actually. They love crop factors. I think that's the future of sensor naming. And if this actually does happen, Sony, if you are watching this, I'm happy to take payment with an Alpha One. Actually, can I have two? Hang on, my cats also each want one. So, uh, seven. Is that okay?